Coming up on this bonus episode of Creative Writing, I'm sharing a modern day parable for the Easter story. Hey there, it's Kirsten from Create If Writing, and this is a special episode of the show that is not at all what the show is normally about. So just to warn you guys, normally I talk about building a platform online for bloggers and writers in a way that's not smarmy. So how to grow your audience, how to connect on social media and email today is not that I don't typically share a whole lot of personal stuff. I share some, but I don't share a lot of things that have to do with my faith. I might mention it here or there, but I really wanted to do an actual special episode talking about that with Easter in mind because I actually have a story that came from my real life that I wanted to share as a kind of modern day parable for the Easter story. So just to warn you, this is going to be about faith. It's going to be about Jesus. I'm going to say his name a lot. So if you are someone who is in my audience that does not believe in Jesus, does not want to hear about Jesus, that's okay. You can still hang out on my podcast. Just maybe you don't want to hear this episode, or maybe you want to hear what I have to say and just are kind of curious about that. So just wanted to share that this is not a normal episode. It's a bonus episode. Totally, totally not in line with the normal flow of the show. But because I am a person who is pretty authentic in terms of I actually want to share my heart with you guys and not just use that as a buzzword, I really felt like I wanted to share this real life story with you guys. It came to mind a few months ago And it's coming to you a little bit late only because my voice has been totally shot for the last month. Yes, month. I have had one thing after another from swollen throat and glands to asthma, which is what I'm currently struggling with now. Yay, asthma. So I want to dive in and share with you guys a modern day parable of the Easter story. And I want to give you a secondary warning. If you're still listening, this is a little bit odd. And you'll see what I mean when I get into the story. It's the kind of story that my mother would be really like annoyed with me for sharing because it, well, just listen and see. It might sound a little heretical at first, but bear with me and hear how this story was one of those moments that I perfectly saw what exactly the Easter story and Jesus and this whole idea of that weird word gospel that people talk about, what it means in my actual life. Are you ready? Let's dive in. So my senior year of high school, I went on a youth group retreat. At this point, I had been involved in the same youth group at a friend's church since off and on about sixth grade. I became a Christian in eighth grade, which means I finally kind of understood what it all meant and that it wasn't just about going to church or being good. And from that point on, there was a lot of growth that happened, but also that happened in sort of relation to my maturity, which wasn't always amazing. So my senior year, I was with a group of maybe five friends, all senior girls, and we didn't actually have a leader that was with us in our cabin. They didn't have enough leaders in that retreat, and a bunch of us had been around for a while, so they kind of left us to our own devices, which mostly we did okay and didn't get into any trouble. But during one of the talks, I vividly remember this moment where I saw a real picture of the gospel in a totally weird way. So let me introduce you to two of my friends. And I'm changing their names just for the sake of protecting them because this is kind of an embarrassing story. First, we have Avery. Again, not a real name. Avery was a really super sweet, friendly girl. I would classify her. Maybe she classified herself as preppy back in the day. She made good grades. She hung out with the good crowd, wore, you know, gap clothes, and was pretty much kind of buttoned up, if that's a good description. Not in a bad way, but just that was more her personality, a little more type A, a little bit more in control, a little bit more prim and proper. And then there's Jessica. Jessica is the opposite of that and came from a family that was just a mess and had become a Christian 
later on, maybe like right before this year even, or had kind of returned to the faith in a very dramatic way after a whole lot of alcohol abuse and other things in her life. So these are my two friends and I was sitting kind of right between them. We're in a big room, maybe about 200, 300 people because we had a pretty big youth group. We're at a camp up in the mountains in Virginia. It had snowed outside. It was a really magical weekend. And our leader, Brian Land, who is now a pastor in Brevard, North Carolina, was talking about something. I don't remember now on the actual message from his lesson, but he was up in the front pacing back and forth in his snow boots and shorts, signature outfit. And all of a sudden, Avery farted. Again, I said, bear with me. This is the part of the story that my mom would be like, you can't say the word fart while I'm saying it because it happened. It was loud, loud. And the few of us that were close by knew that it was Avery. And I could see the flush starting in her cheeks of humiliation and embarrassment. People nearby started to giggle, but not everybody knew who it was at first. I knew because I was right there and a few of us did. I think just the senior group of girls, there's four or five of us. And the giggling got so loud that Brian at the front of the room stopped and said, hey, what's so funny over there? You could have heard a pin drop and Avery's face flamed even brighter. It was one of those moments where I just wanted to fall through the floor with her. But then Jessica spoke up and she said, what? I farted. The whole room erupted in laughter. All two or 300 kids, high school kids, of course, laughing at the fart. Jessica shrugged, kept looking at Brian, waiting for him to go on, and then he did. Meanwhile, I could see the stiffness in Avery's shoulders melting away as she realized that this embarrassing moment, this humiliating moment had been taken away by Jessica, who claimed it as her own. Now, I know this might sound a little bit weird, but let me paint a picture for you. Isaiah chapter 53 is often referred to, especially around Christmas, as one of those prophetic moments in the Old Testament, which is like the older group of books in the Bible before Jesus came. And this chapter really points to Jesus. I'm going to read a couple of verses. It says, He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And that's from Isaiah chapter 53, verses 3 through 6. When I saw my friend Jessica speak up and claim that part as her own, I saw a picture of Jesus. And now I know there's no picture that really does something justice. Metaphors are just metaphors, right? They're just a comparison. They're not the full picture Obviously, Jesus did so much more than that. But in that moment, I saw my friend Avery about to be humiliated and my friend Jessica say, no, it was me. Everybody look at me. Laugh at me. It was mine. I did it. She took it on herself. And when we think about the cross, and this is what I really came to understand when I was like, 14, not in a full way, but enough that I could say that I believed it, was that on the cross, a great exchange was made. Jesus, who was fully perfect, fully righteous in a way that we could never be, 
He took our sin, all the things that we're ashamed of, all the things that we've done wrong, both against other people and also by not making God the number one in our life, the way that he's supposed to be. He took all of that, all that sin, all that shame on himself, the punishment for it. He bore that on the cross. So he took our sin on himself and he gave us his righteousness, his perfectness. And I love the way I've heard this summed up before. He lived the perfect life that we can't live. And he died the death we deserve on the cross so that we might have a relationship with a holy God. And holy is one of those weird, weird words. But I think we all know that if there is a God, he's good. He's perfect and good and knows all because otherwise wouldn't be a God, would it? God is fully perfect, fully righteous. And if we think about it, even the very best of us are not perfect and righteous. There is a gap between us. And that is exactly what that great exchange broached was that gap. In that moment, the great exchange of Jesus putting his righteousness on us and taking our sin on him bridged that gap. And that is such a powerful, powerful thing that I saw in that moment in that room in the mountains of Virginia, as my friend Jessica said, no, it was me. I know this might be a little bit odd, but I really felt compelled to share this story and how I saw this real life picture that barely did justice to what Jesus did for us. Again, this is not something I talk about often on the podcast. This is not a podcast about faith, but I am a person of faith. And I wanted to add this in as a bonus episode so that for those of you who might already believe this, maybe this is an encouragement to you. And if you're still listening, despite yourself, and you're not even sure why, but you wanted to hear what the story is about, I hope that this gives a tiny inkling of a picture of what that whole Jesus thing is, what all these Christians are on about, what this whole Easter thing is about besides the bunnies, because that's what it's about the great exchange, someone undeserving, taking it on themselves, not just any person, but Jesus, fully perfect, taking it on himself, though he did not deserve it. He took that for you. He knows you by name. It says that in the New Testament, he knows the number of hairs on your head, which is both kind of terrifying and also encouraging. If you want to know more about this, reach out to me. Just shoot me an email. I don't care if you're angry or questioning or doubting or just encouraged. I will talk to you either way. And if you're wondering more about this and you want to connect locally with somebody, I can help. I'm really good at searching. It's one of my things. And I will help connect you with some people who locally maybe can help you because online's great. Local is better. Just shoot me an email. Kirsten Oliphant at gmail.com. That's my personal email. You can also text me. Oh my gosh, I'm about to give you my number. I'm doing it. 832-630-3774. And don't forget to tell me who you are so that you don't just text me. I don't know who you are, but I would love to talk with you more about this and point you in a direction. If you want to talk to somebody more about it, this is what Easter is all about. The great exchange, our shame, placed on him who didn't deserve it to bridge that gap so that we could know and be in a relationship with a holy God. Happy Easter to you guys. I hope you have an inspiring and joy-filled week.